Hi guys, Mark here at Blue Goal Electronics. Another fun video, hopefully. Um, we're in the process of moving all of our test gear and whatnot, bench equipment from the house to the barn. And while I'm doing that, I'm taking the chance one piece by piece to make sure it's all up to snuff. You know, if it's something I can calibrate, I'm making sure it's calibrated, making sure everything's functional and working. That way I'm not just bringing problems I may have had in the past forward here into this situation. Anyway, this is a power supply that a ham radio operator gave me years ago when I was first getting into getting away from boat anchors and getting into some uh, VHF, UHF work. And uh, I guess he had a power, spare power supply. He gave me this. At any rate, it works fine. It powers on. It works. No issues. But I was looking. <laughs> this thing's like 25, almost 30 years old now. I don't think it's ever had anything done to it. So before I go put it under my bench, I thought we'd open it up, take a look inside of it, see what it might need. Interesting, when you get inside of something like this and you think, wow, it's probably all factory original, and it's not. This is some type of big diode hanging off up here that's been clamped on. It looks like maybe an extra capacitor added here across the output terminals. And there are certainly some cobwebs. <laughs> this has literally been underneath my bench that you guys have watched many videos on. And I don't think I've taken it out in 15 or 20 years. I've certainly never cleaned it. Um, I use this to drive a flex radio um, that I use on ham radio, a flex 3000 that I've had for a long time. And it does quite a good job at driving it. But um, I'm going to take this thing down, blow it out. Look, look down here. Interesting the stuff you find. This is kind of... <laughs> oh, we'll see what's going on here. All right, guys, so, you know, this is one of those, I don't know whether the guy that I got this from years ago did these mods or whether maybe he got it and these mods were done. But what I'm telling is originally this was the two terminals for the connections on this unit. And these have even been swapped out with some RCA speaker jacks. I mean, a banana speaker jacks, it looks like. They don't look like the originals from the pictures I'm seeing online. These two have been added somewhere over time. And I don't know why, but somebody tacked a 2200 microfarad at 25 volt capacitor across there. I guess maybe to give it a little more than maybe what's in this bank back here. But this is what's really baffling right here. That someone brought, um, when they brought it back here to this, or when they brought it forward here, they took the wire that was originally connected here and they put a great big diode in here. But look at this. I don't know if you can tell. Um, this is just crimped on. Um, and it's super, super loose. Let me see if I can get this one done. All right, you can kind of see here. <laughs> it's just, like I said, all crimped on stuff here. I'm going to take this out. I know what they were trying to do. They were trying to put a block here so that if somebody ran power from the back to the front or somehow fed power in here, it would stop it with a diode. But I just think it's overkill and not needed, and it's just creating an ugly mess here that I think is going to cause a problem. Now, can't complain too much. This thing has worked nonstop for 20 years for me. So I got to take all that with a grain of salt. All right, let's talk about what we are going to do to this unit. Since it is functioning, but I want it to last a long time. Um, first thing I did was pull the fuse out back here and checked it and make sure somebody didn't have a crazy value in it. Second thing, this little wire right here, I don't know why it's been cut. I don't know, spliced, but it's just taped up and I'm going to unsolder that and put some heat shrink tubing on it. Um, someone did extend over here and add on these front jacks. I'm going to leave those because I think they could be handy at some point. But I'm going to get rid of this capacitor across here. It's just extra and not needed. Um, I'm going to go through this little control board right here. And if you'll notice it has a capacitor on it, I'm going to um, replace that cap. Underneath this board back here, um, I think this may be the crowbar circuit here. Um, but you've got your voltage settings and whatnot on it. This board right here is your power supply board. On the other side of it is a whole stack of electrolytic capacitors. We're going to replace those to make sure we're good to go. And then last but not least, we're going to pull off all these transistors off the back, the pass transistors, and we're going to put new heat shrink grease on them uh, to help this thing last a long time. We've also got another little small regulator down here. I'll pull it out and do the same thing to it. I'm going to get busy, do those things. I'll come back and show you what we got when we're done. All right. turns out we need one 2200 microfarad at 25 volts up here on this little control board. 
we need a 4700 right here and we need 76800 at 25 volts i don't happen to have the only one i have here is the 2200 i've got a nice sneaky con gold um but looks like i'm gonna have to order the others okay guys i'm over on mauser.com right now looking for parts let me show you what i would look for in these capacitors i know i need a 2200 microfarad for that little control board i always stick with the value of capacitance i don't go changing that up but i am I do feel better going up to like a 35 volt capacitor as long as there's room there. They're usually a little bit taller, um, but as long as there's room, I'll jump up one more value. That just, it means it runs cooler. Um, but what I'd start to look for are these 10,000 hour components. Okay, they cost a little more. Look, I can get one for a dollar seventy eight, two sixty two, but here I can get this Vichy for three ninety four. But it's a 10,000 hour, hundred and five. Um, degrees Celsius capacitor. It's going to last longer. I want this thing to last the rest of my life, however long that is. So um, I'm going to go through, through here and find these and uh, find one similar to this. All right. The good news is it's got plenty of grease on here. The bad news is it is completely dried up. It was like flaking off <laughs> white powder as I was taking this stuff off. So we'll clean these up and um, check out the micas and we will Put some new grease on them and put these things back on here. I do a good bit of heat sink work. Um, so I really like this MG Chemicals 860 for whatever that's worth. Um, if you get a chance, uh, get some of it. It's a good little size tube, you can see. It'll last a long time and it stays really, uh, stays together. Some of this stuff you buy it and it breaks apart. You end up with a liquid and then a solid. This stuff seems to do a good job. All right, as you can see here, we've replaced all the capacitors on this board. I also replaced the one up here on this board. Uh, that was really my goal in this, was somewhat of a recap job. Redo the heat shrink grease. Uh, undo some of the ugliness over here, which I'm still working on. Okay, I just want to catch you up on the other things we've done to this unit to this point. If you remember, this was uh, some kind of wire nut or something before. I soldered that together, put some heat shrink tubing over it, and heat sink and heat shrink keep tripping me up in this video. Um, the other thing I did was all these units here that were crimped on, I ended up pulling them off, unscrewing, pulling them off, and then putting solder down in each of them. So I left the crimp connections, but they're all now soldered and not just held in by crimps. I removed this diode that honestly... I might could provide a little protection in some circumstance. I can't think of a good one. So at any rate, it's out of the picture. And this little capacitor that was across the output that I think is adding no value because it's all in parallel with that new board uh, that I just recapped. So all of that is up to speed at this point. So all the ugliness gone. So there hopefully there's some good lessons in here for you guys. Um, there are two boards here that provide some type of control mechanism. And if you'll notice, there's a potentiometer right here, there is a potentiometer right here, and there is a potentiometer right down here, okay? And so I could not find a schematic for this unit anywhere. This is a FR40A. I found a schematic for an FR40, but it is a very different unit than the FR40A. So when you don't have a schematic, but you've got a control board like this, what do you do? Well, the first thing I did was pull out a little light here and shine it on each of these chips. There's a chip here on this unit and a chip here. Let's go over to the PC and talk about what purposes both of those may be playing. And from that, we can then deduce what these little circuits may be and what these role these potentiometers ultimately may play. Kind of reverse engineer this thing a little bit. All right, let me tell you why this right now is so exciting to me. One, we've got a circuit. We don't know what it does. We don't know what its purpose is. And it's got a strange little chip sitting on it. This to me is the fun part of electronics. I don't have a schematic. I don't have a clue what it does. But we get to hone our electronic sleuthing skills by shining the flashlight on that little chip, reading the number off of it, putting it into our friend Google, and coming up with a data sheet for it. So I found out this was a micro A723 chip, precision voltage regulator, 14 pin chip here. I started looking at this thing. It's got things like current limiting, current sequencing, frequency compensation, reference voltage, so on and so forth. I come down here and I start looking at how this thing might work, right? I then get a schematic of how this thing works. But more than that, 
I get down here into the application notes. They start telling you how these things are used, okay? And typical operation for these things. And what I found was comparing that little circuit to what's in their application notes, this is actually a fallback current limiting circuit. And what that does is here on the um, x-axis, we've got current, y-axis here, we've got our voltage out. The voltage out is constant. So this thing's putting out, let's say I've got it adjusted for 13.8 volts. 13.8, 13.8, 13.8. As we approach the maximum current out that this amplifier can provide, so let's throw, say somebody throws a load across it that draws more current than it can put out. This is a 40 amp power supply. Let's say somebody throws a load on it that pulls 50 amps. Well, what does this thing do when it hits 40 amps right here? It's a voltage regulator. It can control the voltage out. So what does it do? It does this function called foldback. And there's this knee right here. And there's a current point that you adjust and set using a potentiometer for where the knee is on this. You can put the knee down here at 10 amps, 20 amps, 30 amps, 40 amps. But wherever you set it at, all of a sudden this thing will then start folding back the voltage in an effort to somewhat shut down this unit, quit producing as much output at that point, ultimately reducing the current from this thing and put it into a safe mode. As that load goes away, voltage will go right back up there. Current can go right back up there. But if it hits this knee point again, it'll start folding it back and safely shutting it down a little bit. All right, so on to the next board. We do the same thing. We look at the chip, TYN692. I Google it. Come to find out it's an SCR or thyristor. And what these devices are known for, it's basically like a little diode here, okay? But when you turn them on via the gate, then these things can handle a large amount of current through them. And that's the beauty. If you look at the features, high surge current, high on state current, right? Highly reliable, blah, blah, blah. So what these get used in is something called a crowbar circuit. And it's just what it sounds like, okay? So what happens is it's to sense for over voltage. In other words, if the voltage at the gate, which by the way is measured right off the output of this power supply, let's say it gets to 14 volts or 15 volts, whatever you want to set it at. I think about 14.2 is the magic number here for us. I'm going to set this one up because uh, this thing's supposed to operate around 13.8. But let's say something start, bad starts happening. Shorting in the transformer, um, the windings, maybe it's putting out more voltage than it should. Maybe the voltage regulators run away. Maybe a component around it's gone bad. All of a sudden, this thing's putting out more voltage than it should. Let's say you've got this unit hooked up to a $2,000 ham radio. You certainly don't want to fry your ham radio by putting out too much voltage. So this circuit crowbar circuit is designed to prevent against that and it works in conjunction with the circuit we talked about a minute ago what happens is you set it so that if the the gate here sees a certain voltage say 14 volts whatever it triggers to turn on this diode basically and then it's basically like throwing a crowbar across the output so you would put the anode and the cathode directly across the outputs of this thing. So basically what you're doing is shorting the output leads together, which then does what? It causes your other current sensing mechanism to kick in, shut down the voltage regulator, reduce the current, so on and so forth. Once the voltage goes back down to normal, this thing turns back off, and then you don't have that crowbar thrown across the output. So let's get back on the bench and get these things adjusted. Thought you need a little bit of background before we go do that. Okay, so we've got the little board right here. How did I figure out then which of these little devices was the uh, current sensing setting that we talked about a minute ago versus what is controlling the output voltage of this power supply? Well, up here's our bench power supply, and I literally just came in here and started playing with one of them, and I noticed one of them quickly adjust my output voltage. So I wanted around 13.8 volts, somewhere around there. But ideally, I'm going to want it at 13.8 volts under some type of load. And that's what we've got down here. So I can uh, come in here and say uh, 10, enter. And I can turn this on. And if you'll notice now, we're down to 13.79 volts because I am pulling 10 amps of current. now. 
This is a BNK Precision programmable DC electronic load. These things are not inexpensive. So I don't expect everyone to have one of those. So my guess is if you want to do that, just bump it up a little higher, maybe 13.85 or something like that. You'll know when you have some load on it. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have one of these. But if you do a good amount of power supply work, you might want to have one. Anyway, we figured out which one sets the voltage. Then what I did was I used my programmable load here enough to adjust the um, fold back. So I've got this thing set right now, honestly, where it folds back right at 40 amps. Okay, I actually made it 38 amps because I don't think I'll ever use this thing fully for 40 amps. And I think it might have been overrated a little bit at the 40 amp level. So I've got it set to where... Um, when you get up to about 38 amps, the thing starts pulling back down. You see the voltage start going down on this thing. And I did that just by increasing the um, current load here and adjusting the fold back. And then this over here is just about as simple. You start raising the voltage over here with the voltage setting again. And you can adjust this thing to where it'll shut off. Um, let me just watch, watch up there. I'll go up in voltage, and at some point around 15 volts, oh, and I may need to adjust this. Watch this. I'm going to put it down, back down to 15, around 14.9. And if I adjust this back down a little bit, it cuts out completely. See that? No voltage. So I found the magic point right there where it cut off at, and now... If I turn the voltage back down on this unit, so it's not way up there, and I turn it off, and then turn it back on, we should get our 14 volts back up. Um, any more than that, we're going to trip the circuit right there, and I'm going to take this thing back down to 13.8 or so here. Um, you get the idea. I need to do a little fine-tuning when I'm not on camera here. But that's how I'm going to go about adjusting um, all the settings on this thing. I think this thing's done. It's running beautifully. It runs quiet. I can run this thing at 20, 25, 30 amps. It runs quiet all day. I don't think I'll ever pour more than about 25 amps through this. So we're good to go. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you learned a little something here today. Um, stay tuned. More coming.